channels we can review. Did Israel bomb a target in Lebanon? Why these children are chanting about the Lubavitcher Rebbe, this woman's startling life story after leaving ultra-Orthodoxy, and more of the Jewish news that's changing your world right now in this episode of the Week in Review. Hello and welcome to the Jewish Channel's Week in Review. I'm Stephen I. Weiss. Lebanon was struck in an air attack Monday, but Israel is keeping quiet about whether or not it was responsible. Lebanese news organizations reported that an Israeli airstrike hit a site controlled by Hezbollah, could be used for training and arms storage, and is located on the Lebanon-Syria border. Israel was reportedly the source of as many as five airstrikes in Syria in 2013, with the reported rationale being the elimination of weapon shipments to Hezbollah, which is both a terror organization that has targeted Israel and is allied with Syrian ruler Bashar Assad in the civil war taking place in Syria. And while the reporting on these airstrikes is solid and backed up by significant evidence, there are some headlines you shouldn't believe this week. Many news organizations are suggesting that Iran's legislature is upset with Foreign Minister Javad Zarif for his recognizing the Holocaust. And while 54 legislators have in fact signed on to a petition calling on Zarif to explain his remarks that included statements about the historicity of the Holocaust, it appears that their concern is related to what Zarif said about Israel. As we reviewed in recent weeks, Zarif has repeatedly acknowledged the Holocaust. When he did so in an interview with German television in early February, he called the Holocaust, quote, tragically cruel and should not happen again. Zarif also provided comment in this context about Israel, saying, quote, after the problem with the Palestinians is resolved, the conditions that will enable recognition of the state of Israel will be established. It is that second comment which suggested that Iran might recognize the state of Israel that has actually generated on-the-record condemnation from within Iran. There is no specific reported reason to believe that the legislature is unhappy with Zarif about his remarks regarding the Holocaust, while there are multiple statements suggesting they are unhappy with his remarks about Israel. But on the topic of what should or shouldn't be said about the Jewish people, video surfaced this week of Lubavitch Hasidim giving candy to children allegedly in Africa if they would repeat the slogan that Lubavitch Messianists used to claim that the Lubavitch Rebbe is still alive and the Messiah. The slogan, Yechi Adonenu Morenu Verabenu Melech HaMoshiach Le'olam Va'ed, means may our leader, teacher, and rabbi, the King Messiah, live forever. Here's that video. <laughs> okay, you have everybody the together say Yechi. Yechi! Adoinainu! Myreinu! Verabeinu! Melech! For you! Hamashiach! Hamashiach! Leoilam! Boy! Beautiful! It should be noted that the Lubavitchers here are perhaps doing this in more of a joking manner, as immediately afterward, one of them gets the children to chant, Shmuley Danziger is the Mashiach, presumably they're referring to the man he's working with. But moving on to a realm where performers receive better compensation for their work, Meredith Gansman interviews playwright Charles Bush about his new play. After 18 plays, Jewish playwright and actor Charles Bush is ready to try something new. Known for his Tony-nominated play, The Tale of the Allergist's Wife, and for playing female characters in such productions of his work as Die, Mommy, Die, Vampire Lesbians of Sodom, and Psycho Beach Party, in his newest play, the tribute artist, Bush wrote himself a male role. Well, a male role who works as a female impersonator. For a long time I've wanted to do uh, a story where I, I was a, a fellow who's posing as a woman, because usually in my plays I just play the female lead. The tribute artist explores the similarities between Bush's character Jimmy and the woman he impersonates, his late landlady Adriana. He's so fluid into it that, that he finds actually that the more he's himself, the more the people seem to, uh, to buy the impersonation. A major character in the play is a transgender teenager, and Bush was excited to write that part, especially with the lack of such roles on stage. I thought it would be interesting, in one way, that Jimmy's uh, gender is so fluid that he kind of goes from man to woman, woman to man, so effortlessly, that maybe it would be interesting to have, to have somebody who is so defined and so definite about who 
he thinks he is. Bush said he grew up loving Jewish strains of comedy and has been fascinated with classic films since he was a small child. However, Bush realizes that contemporary audiences may be less familiar with the classic references in what he calls his movie pastiche plays. You know, I tried to make it so that, uh, yeah, I mean, if you, if you, you know, if you know the movie genre, it's, it's, it's fantastic, but it's got to be funny just in its own right. To see more from Charles Bush and the tribute artist, tune into the full broadcast version of the Week in Review. Thank you, Meredith. Leah Vincent spent the first 16 years of her life immersed in the ultra-Orthodox world. When she left, she was unequipped to deal with the world as most of us experience it. And the shocking story that followed is recounted in her new memoir, Cut Me Loose. My interview with Leah Vincent is included in this week's episode of Up Close. Someone else who was familiar with condemnation from the ultra-Orthodox world was Rabbi Mordechai Kaplan, who was excommunicated before he founded a new movement in Judaism. Also in this week's episode of Up Close, I interview the author of a new book about Kaplan and his influence, The Radical American Judaism of Mordechai M. Kaplan by Mel Skult. Here are some of the highlights from my interview with Leah Vincent. Your book gets into what is now almost a genre of people leaving the ultra-Orthodox world and then writing about their departure. But you have a pretty different take in that you're, you're not really writing about so much what your ultra-Orthodox upbringing was like, but more of the, the, the traumatic experiences that came from being kind of foisted on the, upon the world without knowledge of how to engage with it. Yeah, it's much more a story of what, happens, what happened after I left and not so much a story of an expose on the world I came from. You gradually entered into the, the secular world broadly uh, and, and where you found that being an innocent woman, not really aware of, of, of what is expected and, and how people act, you were taken advantage of by a, a number of men who acted horribly. It's, it's in many ways a story about what it's like to be a woman in this world. Yeah, I, I think that's true. And uh, it, there's a danger in telling the story because what happened to me in the secular world is what I had been warned would happen to me. If you go out there, people will rape you and hurt you and da da da. And in a way, that's true. But I think that if you read the story and you reflect on it, it's very clear that what happened to me happened some to some degree because I encountered bad people in bad situations, but mostly because I was very ill-equipped to deal with the real world. And not only did I not have the tools, I was actually set up to become a victim the lifestyle I was raised in the yeshivish community, the particular sect of that that I was raised in, uh, shapes children in a very particular way, and they expect their children to have a certain kind of life, and when that life was no longer available to me, I, it really led to a lot of very difficult and challenging circumstances. You're a published author, you're a graduate of Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, and you're, a, you're an activist, you, ha you live in the, in the village with a husband and child, uh, but what was the life that was expected of you? It was vastly different. And you know, what's interesting is the differences on the outside look different, but it was a difference on the inside, like the internal person that I was supposed to be that are so incredibly different. Um, I expected to get married when I was 18 or 19 to somebody that my parents would do a lot of research into beforehand to make sure our families and our values matched up. I would go out with them a few times, and if it seemed like we got along with each other, we would get engaged and get married very quickly, and I uh, would become a wife and a mother. And my whole sense of self would be so defined by what does God want from me in this moment, and how do I make my husband happy, and how do I adhere to the rules that the rabbis who guide my community are setting down, and how do I be, good, be a good mother to my ever-growing crowd of children. And what do you think it was that sparked the change from that trajectory to the trajectory that led you here today? There were a lot of steps along the way that sort of started to sever my relationship with my family and the faith they represented. And I kept on, I was not somebody who was looking to leave my faith when this whole journey initially started. And I kept on clinging to the way, the ideas I had been raised with, even though they had been trying, kept on trying to push me away. And as I got older, I started to be excluded from my father's world and I loved him so much and I really treasured the small relationship I had with him and to realize like I was no, my brother-in-laws who could talk and learning were going to start to take my place and I was moving further and further away from him. It really started to uh, imbalance and make, make my sense of security in my world start to be shaky. 
A reminder, you can see the full episode of Up Close on the Jewish Channel on cable or listen to the full audio as a podcast available on iTunes or in your favorite podcast player. That's all for this week. From all of us here at the Jewish Channel, be well. The Jewish Channel is available on cable. Time Warner Cable Channel 528, IO Optimum Channel 505, RCN Channel 268, Bright House Channel 330, Verizon Fios Channel 900, Cox Cable Channel 1, Frontier Communications, and on Comcast in the on-demand menu under Premium Channels. For more information, visit TJCTV.com.